This show is brought to you by Ridley College. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> who, who put this here? What? You know, perhaps it's a measure of your compassion for your students. Uh, I don't I know. <laughs> I am Michael the Merciful, abounding in covenant love to my students for three or four minutes or generations. I forget which one. I thought your big uh, policy was to be feared and loved in the classroom. Well, no, remember my policy is I want students to be afraid of how much I love them. Oh, mate, I will toast you to love and mercy for your students. Okay. To, Cheers, to mate. love and mercy. Surviving Deconstruction. Mike, it's hard to have Christian heroes and even Christian friends these days. It looks like everybody's dropping their faith. They're dropping like flies. Yet we're in a period of deconstruction. And, you know, it's, it's, it's serious. There's a, there's a lot of people who are questioning their faith. Sometimes it's from, like, intellectual reasons. You know, how can God allow suffering, that type yeah. of thing. Sometimes you think it's more of uh, a kind of existential thing like you know um if, if there is a god does he really care about us uh some people wonder whether their faith has simply been part of their culture mm. uh, some people have been burned by churches the way they've handled sexual abuse allegations you know whether you're catholic or baptist or presbyterian that's been a big issue people wondering about whether it's just been there to prop up a type of conservative political culture and they're looking back yeah. on it now you know particularly when you get into your mid to late 20s or early 30s and they're saying is the whole thing just a sham is it just something i bought into i mean when when, when you hear someone talking in those terms um scott what do you naturally think about well i think uh that it's very hard to keep your faith alive when you are isolated, particularly if you've been hurt. And during the pandemic in particular, we were isolated from one another. We couldn't really engage in those Christian practices that keep faith alive, really. Um, so I wasn't surprised that people were speaking about themselves as ex-evangelicals, like former evangelicals, or as former Christians or non-practicing Christians. People were distancing themselves from being Christians. I actually found it really disturbing, sad. How did you find it? Yeah, I thought it was sad as well. And I think everyone's story is a bit different. Yeah. Um, like I know a lot of figures, like if you've grown up in a house where your dad was like some celebrity pastor or Christian speaker or celebrity theologian and everyone just assumes you're just going to do what your dad did and you get to some sort of point where you realize you never really liked your dad in the mm. first place <laughs> and he was just mean to you and all sorts of things like that going on or you know you've been part of a kind of a, of a, of a big a big industry, a big ministry, and you know how the sausage got, got made. Your job is to make sure there's a good front, but you know the ugly behind it. Yeah. And you could easily, people say, look, why am I defending this ugly sausage machine? You know, I know, th I know the guy at the front of this is just a fake, or he doesn't practice what he believes, or he's a jerk, or, you know, whatever it is. There can be things that just leave you so gutted yeah. and so um, lost that you just want to walk away from the whole thing. So, Mike, people have um, often asked us at Ridley and beyond how we have kept our faith alive in face of the very ugly side of Christianity, right? So here's a couple of points that you and I have thought about together, and they're symbolised here by a candle. Firstly, when two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, he is with us. So when we gather together, whatever we do as a Christian community, it's with Christ at the centre. It's about him. It's not about us being celebrities. And any pride, anything that would go against humility, meekness, purity of heart and righteousness has to go. Right. We meet in Jesus' name. The candle reminds us of that. Secondly, the candle reminds us of Christ, the light of the world. And everything we do in Christ's name needs to be done under his light and he shines on the dark and the ugly things. And we need to recognise them for what they are, repent, do actions of repair and contrition and move on and leave the ugly behind. And the third point that the candle reminds us of is that God is present both in our losses and laments, just as Jesus is at Lazarus's tomb, but God is also present with us when there is great joy in mission together. And Jesus rejoices when his disciples 
return to him with great news. So the presence of God, the light of God, and the God who is with us in loss and in joy is something that's kept you and I grounded in this period of ugliness that we've seen in the church. Yeah, and for me, you can see how in a Christianized culture, things can go very badly wrong. You can be involved in a toxic church you or can. where there's some toxic yeah. leadership. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, for me, here's the thing. I, I lived the first 20 years of my life apart from Christ. I did become right. a Christian until I was 20. And I know that the world apart from Christ is cold, brutal, and dark. Mm. Okay, so I, I know what the ugly of the church is like, but I also know what the ugliness of the world without Christ is. Uh, is like. Right. And I would definitely have Christ any day of the week and twice on Sunday uh, compared to a world without that. The best thing about Christianity remains Christ, okay? And that is, that's the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah. And that's why I can I can relate to what Peter said, you know, with everyone's dropping like flies, abandoning you, and, and Jesus asked Peter, are you going to leave as well? And Peter says, well, to whom shall we go? Yeah, exactly. You've got the words of eternal life. Um, as bad as the disciples are of Jesus, despite questions, you know, doubts, moments of despair, uh, I, I, I cannot abandon the Christ who gave himself for me. So I want to hear a little bit about what are the practices that you do? Like, do you pray every day? Do you watch church services? Like, what do you actually do to keep that organic relationship with Jesus alive? What does Mike Bird do? Yeah, I love <laughs> reading my Greek New Testament. That's okay. a big thing try to read a paragraph or a couple of um, sections a day, yeah, uh, okay. which is, you know, practices by Greek, but, you know, it's it also keeps me, me going on that level. And, I mean, recently I've been reading through 2 Corinthians. Reading 2 Corinthians through the pandemic was really refreshing because you see Paul in his pain and frustration mm. uh, that he's pouring out in this letters and uh, this, you know, and it's you know, it's it's for real. I found that very encouraging. Uh, I enjoy praying with my kids. Also, watching my wonderful wife Naomi do a series of children's videos for yeah. our church. Yeah, okay. That was good because it's good to see her doing some ministry stuff, and good to see her, you know, doing ministry with a positive Christian message for children. And that, for me, has been the most encouraging thing I've had during this pandemic period. But now and not yet. Hey. Thanks for tuning in to The Now and Not Yet, the show that keeps you plugged in with Bible and theology. Make sure you subscribe and hey, hang around till the very end because we've got a book giveaway for you. You know, it's always good to look at a biblical studies book as well. We often talk a lot about themes and issues, but I like covering an actual book of the Bible. And one of my favorite books of the Bible has to be the book of Isaiah. Wait, Isaiah, isn't it Isaiah? Yes, our American cousins sadly mispronounce a key book of the Bible, the book of Isaiah, not the book of Isaiah, and they, uh, they deserve to be chastised for it. So you're saying that the Australian accent is God's gift to the world in terms of Old Testament names. Isaiah gets it right. Yeah, I think it's definitive in terms of the revelation. You don't understand God's revelation until you've heard it read in the Australian form of English. Thank you. That's what John the Baptist said. Moving on. <laughs> yes, but did you know that Isaiah is called the fifth gospel? Okay, so in addition to the four Gospels in the New Testament, this is as useful as a Gospel? Well, this is this is kind of the Gospel for the Gospels. What do you mean? Well, I mean, the Gospel writers, when they describe Jesus, how he's the fulfillment, how he is the prophesied one, yeah. uh, they're often harking back to themes from the book of Isaiah. I mean, Mark's Gospel begins, you know, as it's written in Isaiah, by which he kind of means Exodus and Malachi, but that's another story. <laughs> okay. But he treats um, Isaiah and the sort of new Exodus motif as programmatic for his own story of Jesus. Uh, Matthew was constantly referencing, you know, as it's written in the prophet Isaiah, you find it also in Luke and Acts. I mean, if you want to understand the New Testament, you know, the, the, well, certainly the four Gospels and Acts, you find a lot of Isaiah there because they're reworking Isianic themes around Jesus. Well, what, I mean, what are the key themes in the book of Isaiah that relate to who Jesus is? Oh, well, there's a number. There's a number. One, you've got this idea that God is going to show himself as king. God is coming and he's coming as king and he's going to save his people from exile. There's going to be an end to the Babylonian captivity. He's going to send them his new servant. There's going to be great prosperity and blessing for God's people. There's going to be liberation, forgiveness of sins. There's a whole package of 
of things going on. And it's all about the day when God comes and he comes as king. Read Isaiah 52 on that. That's where you get this, this, this glad tidings, this gospel yeah. in Isaiah 52 that God is coming. He's coming as king to save his people. And the evangelists in particular say, and God is coming in the person of Jesus. Okay, so when, when God comes, Jesus comes. Yeah, well, Jesus is the coming of God. Yeah. Yeah. In, his, in, in his own person. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's a fantastic theme. You've also got all the echoes of the suffering servant of Isaiah, Isaiah 53. Yeah, right. You know, I'm, I'm sure you, all of you uh, read it at least during Easter or something like that. But, you know, the suffering servant, the one who by his stripes other people are healed. Yes. Now, there's a little bit of debate as to who the servant is. Is it just a symbol for Israel? Is it a prophet? Uh, is it some sort of symbol or figure who represents Israel? Uh, but in the Gospels, it's applied to Jesus. Like he, oh, yeah. He's understood as the one who suffers. Yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, he is the servant of the Lord. He's the one who suffers and <clears throat> brings atonement, brings healing to others. I mean, there's so much good stuff in the book of Isaiah. I like chapters 42 and 49. Uh, because they talk about being a light to the Gentiles, which is you know partly the mission of Israel in the world, but it's also the role attributed to the servant, which is then carried on to the church, because Paul and Barnabas are also described as being a light to the Gentiles, which goes to show that the mission of Israel, Jesus, is continued in the very church as well. And we could go to the end. We could talk about the vision of the new creation in Isaiah 66. It's such, it's such a wonderful vision. What about you, what about you Scott? Well, for me, Mike, Isaiah is a little bit like what I'm holding in this hand, which is a massage gun. Can I can I just massage you a little bit on the shoulder? Is that... Okay, that 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 is very weird. That is very weird. Okay, nice That's though, weird. right? Yeah, actually, it is. It is. It, it is. Oh, yeah, good. I've got a, I've got a sore arm from tennis. So that's that's actually <laughs> pretty good. That's that's massaging pretty well. Yeah. So Isaiah for me is a little bit like this massage gun because when I'm feeling tight, when I'm feeling burdened, when things are just not relaxed and confident in God, I read passages in Isaiah like this one from Isaiah 11. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will die, lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearlings together and a little child will lead them. These are promises about the future. And these promises give me assurance that one day we will be in a new creation. And the tightness and the difficulty and the burdens of this world won't last forever. So Isaiah for me is a lot like this. It's a theological massage, my friend. That's good. Well, I mean, going from the theme of massage, I think it's also a missional document. Okay. Okay. Yep. There's a lot, there's a lot about how how you know Israel needs to be redeemed and rescued. Mm -hmm. But once that happens, it's going to spill over and affect the Gentiles. So there's, there's a lot about how the rest of the world is going to participate in Israel's own restoration. And, that's, and this is a big theme in biblical theology because a lot of people think you can jump from Genesis 3 to kind of John 3, you know. So yep. you've, got, you've got sin and then, you know, Jesus is whom God sent to save the world. But there's a biblical story in there and the story of Israel uh, is part of God's rescue plan because salvation can only come to and through Israel. Okay, You've got to remember that in God's plan, a transformed Israel was meant to transform the world. Yes. And that's what Jesus carries forward. He carries forward the vocation of Israel mm. in himself, mm. which is then continued on in the mission and ministry of the church. So Isaiah, it's got a big, a big Christological focus, if you read it in a canonical sense, but it's got themes about God, it's got themes about mission, themes about future hope, and some real uplifting passages as well. It's a missional, messianic document, and that's why I love it. It really renews us in our faith, our mission, and in our, our, our sense of God's love for us. So, Mike, if I want to dip into Isaiah and, and read it, um, where's a helpful place to start? Do you start at the beginning if you want to get into Isaiah, or are there maybe some key passages you'd uh, get into first? Would you start, say, at Isaiah 11 or Isaiah 6? Where do you start if you want to engage with the book of Isaiah? Well, 
if it was me, I'd probably read it in order from chapters okay. 1 to 66. But if there's one section I would want to focus on yeah. and pay particular attention to, it would be Isaiah 40 to 55, sort of the, the middle section. That's where you get all these big servant poems describing, you know, God coming as king to rescue his people, this mysterious servant who mm. also suffers and, you know, the trials and tribulations of God's people. That, that's what I, I would get into. If you want a good helpful resource to get into Isaiah, a uh, friend of ours, uh, Andrew Abernethy, former lecturer at Ridley College, yeah, Andy. now somewhere in North America in a mysterious place called Chicago, uh, <laughs> if that's how it's pronounced. Uh, he he's got a good little book on interpreting Isaiah. That's one I would definitely recommend. Yeah, great. Hot off the press. So, uh, Mike, one of the ways that I found really helpful for keeping faith alive during lockdown, and we live in officially the world city that had the greatest lockdown in terms of length, was I formed an Augustine reading group. It was great. We'd meet on Zoom when we read confessions and other documents. Now, the group was fantastic, but one of the challenges we had was to find a good translation of Augustine's Confessions, which is his spiritual autobiography, where he describes God, our role in God's plan, and what a lover, what a friend God is to us. The problem is old translations of the Confessions are very clunky. Let me give you an example. Book one begins as such. Great art thou, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is thy power and thy wisdom infinite. And these would man praise, man but a particle of thy creation, man that bears about his mortality, the witness of his sin, and so forth. So it's very these and thous, pretty clunky. Yeah, yeah. I'm falling asleep already. Yeah. There yeah. is a great translation by Sarah Rudin. This is what we used in our group. Here's how the same passage reads in her translation. You are mighty master and to be praised with a powerful voice, great is your goodness. And your wisdom, like that, there is no reckoning. Yet to praise you is the desire of every human being who is some part of what you've created, a human hauling his deathliness in a circle, hauling in a circle the evidence of his sin and the evidence that you stand against the arrogant. But still immortal, a given portion of your creation, longs to praise you, in yourself you raise us, giving us delight in glorifying you because you made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. So you can see it's a much smoother translation. Um, our group loved Sarah Rudin's translation and I'd recommend it to anyone who's reading and studying Augustine. That's a new translation of the confessions. Okay, sounds like a, a good rendition of a spiritual classic. Yeah, it sure is. Excellent. And now, hot off the press. Here we go. Oh, ooh, these are hot. They're so hot off the press. The first, Finding Jesus in the Storm by John Swinton. He wants to talk about how Christians handle medical diagnoses to do with mental health challenges, which is um, what he calls uh, mental health um, disease. And so he works through the problem of diagnosis, he works through the problem of trying to relate the spiritual to the natural as we deal with mental health. He has some amazing stories and insights. He's a former nurse. He speaks from his own um, experience dealing with mental health. So if you're involved in a community, you have experiencing mental health challenges yourself, or you're caring for friends, this is an excellent book for you to start to think through the numerous dimensions of a person and what it means to suffer from mental health challenges. Really, really helpful. And here's the second book that's hot off the press and absolutely excellent. It's a book that deals with spirituality and well-being. And the claim of the book is that we often speak about uh, well-being in secular ways that have very little to do with spirituality. And faith in different religious approaches, is sidelined. And what this book is, is a series of articles by researchers into the phenomena of religion saying that when you really look at the data, spirituality is very, very important for people's well-being regardless of their religion. But sadly, the secularization of medicine in particular means that the question of faith and spirituality is sidelined. So this is a call for real science, i.e. science that integrates the empirical data 
that says that spirituality is good for people into medical practice. It's an excellent book. Excellent. Well, my book for review is by Lewis Marcos. It's called From Plato to Christ. Now, if you don't know, Plato was a 5th century Greek philosopher who cast a huge shadow over the subsequent philosophy of the Hellenistic world, the world in which the New Testament was written and which the church began to grow. And this is a great introduction to Plato, the main elements of his thought, but also how Plato um, influenced or provide a kind of grammar or toolbox that many of the church fathers and even indeed people into the present time like C.S. Lewis, how they used a lot of Plato to explain their own faith, to try show how Christian theology, uh, faith in God is coherent and makes sense. So th this is a great book. Um, I feel he does maybe Christianize Plato a tad bit too much. Uh, with some caveats as he goes along, but I thought Lewis Marcus provides a great introduction to Plato for Christians and particularly his relevance for Christian theology. So, Mike, a lot of people have said that Jesus, as it says in Galatians, was born at just the right time, and that includes Jesus being born into cultural realities that included Platonism and Middle Platonism as resources for theology. Is that the kind of view that this book holds. I think it does. I think uh, Lewis argues something along those lines that Hellenistic philosophy became a great conduit, a great way of talking about God, reality, faith, being in the world, you know, that kind of a thing. Now, not everything in Plato is compatible with Christ, yeah. uh, but, but it gives a really good introduction to Plato, the main books, the main themes, and then shows how Christian authors themselves appropriated Plato as their own restatement of the Christian faith. So for students coming to Ridley to do early church history, for example, this might be a good book to read in the summer preceding doing early church history with us. Would that be right? Yeah, look, if you get Plato confused with Pluto, a cartoon character, <laughs> and you're not really big on Plato, if you want to say, what's this Plato thing, what's the deal? Uh, yeah, this is definitely a book I would consider reading. And if you read it, it will make it easier to understand all sorts of things that happen in the New Testament, but also when you read early Christian theology as well. Yeah, so this book we've just reviewed, the new translation by Rudin, in the Confessions... Uh, the use of Middle Platonism um, is huge. So if you understood that book, it would be really helpful for this Christian spiritual classic. That's Excellent. fantastic, mate. Good on you. Excellent. But now and not yet. Thanks for joining us today. We've thought about deconstructing faith, keeping faith alive, the book of Isaiah, and then some helpful new books on spirituality, well-being, and history. Yeah, but there's still some good things to come in future episodes of the Now and the Not Yet. Okay. We are going to have a giveaway. Oh, I've got some great ideas. I don't know what now we're giving away. Now and Not Yet massage gun, golden sunglasses, Hawaiian t-shirt. An Augustan bobblehead or maybe, maybe calendar of top Anglican theologians. Mittens for catching the hot of the press books. Miniature <laughs> Now and Not Yet coffee mugs for the small diminutive person in your life <laughs> exactly right which is normally me in my house all right well i'm looking forward to to the giveaways me too me too scott well that's been the now and not yet for now we'll see you next time don't forget to like subscribe share and tell all of your friends hey there before you go don't forget there is a book giveaway contest you can enter if you subscribe and leave a comment, you could be a chance to win a signed copy of my book, Evangelical Theology. Details below, enter so you don't miss out. The Now and Not Yet, the show that keeps you plugged into everything Bible and theology.